so, uh, so yeah, uh, next video is, I'm going to call this video, Don't Judge a Man by the State of His Van, because, <laughs> because if I was watching this, I would look at this van or something on YouTube and I'd be like, that's a mess, and it is a mess, but, um, that, that might not be the best, um, basis on which to judge me or what I'm saying or something um, and I've just got a little story about that because I was saying earlier like that I went to a Zen retreat it's about uh, I don't know six hours later by the way I've come I've driven south from Coventry um, on my way to London because I'm going to another retreat this meditation retreat this um, this weekend so I've just been driving uh, you can see it's still pretty miserable outside. Um, there's nothing to really see. And basically, I pulled up in a, a little car park on the side of the motorway somewhere here. Uh, but I just like to keep um, one aspect of the video to be about the van life because I used to watch. Well, I still do watch like people that live in vans, and I love. I just love the sense of freedom you get from living in a van and being on the move or a caravan or whatever like a camper van you know um, or maybe just that whole lifestyle you know this whole freedom we are we can do what we want to do within within reason anyway I'm getting both I'm getting sidetracked what I'm saying is um, yeah so the state of my van like no doubt it's it's a mess um, <laughs> I probably don't even look amazingly healthy myself. I'm kind of partway going vegan from vegetarian, so um, still is struggling with that a little bit, you know. Um, plus, I gave up smoking like a month ago, and um, drinking shed loads of water. My body's going through some crazy changes. I really feel like there's uh, 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 shedding my skin in a way. Literally, I am shedding my flipping skin. I'm drinking like four litres of water a day and I've still got really dry skin and I think it's because I'm going through a cleansing process so but anyway to get back to the point of what I wanted to say here is that I, um, I don't think uh, people should judge me well you can hey judge me people will judge me if they want to judge me but what I mean is um, a little story that that to make sense of that for me was um, this retreat that I went on this last weekend uh, it was a turning point in my life, no doubt. But there was one thing I realised, which is that my teacher, who she's been my Zen teacher since about eight or nine years ago, when I first came across this school of Zen, and I knew nothing about it, and I didn't really know. I've always been interested in Zen, but basically, I came across her, right? And I went to this retreat, and I had some kind of crazy experience there, and um, it was tough, man. I mean, it was really, really tough, but. The point of what I'm trying to get at is that I've gone back to the Zen kind of path from time to time between then and now over the last eight years and uh, there are times when I've um, renounced it completely and thought this is not only random and doesn't really make sense but it's not really right for me you know and um, it's really tough or sometimes thought that and some of the things that we recite in the morning chants I would take issue with or I would think why are we doing this chanting it's stupid and loads of thinking but I never identified it as thinking and, and that's part of what is so golden about this retreat that I've just been on it's been like a turning point because finally I've started to see or have seen <laughs> that it's the thinking like thinking itself isn't a problem we need to think right but it's when we get attached to thoughts and we believe them to be completely true completely true and they hook us you know like Pema Chodra on this Buddhist teacher she talks about being hooked by things and in terms of the judging thing what I want to get at is that I looked at my teacher um, years ago and I uh, sort of judged her you know as you, as we all do we all judge people and 
whether we like it or not to some extent and I sort of looked at her and I thought uh, you know why should I necessarily listen to you uh, you know I'm the kind of person I would question anything especially uh, someone in a position of any kind of authority I mean she's not really she's a teacher she, uh, you know she's not and she's never been authoritarian I'm just saying that I would look at her and I'd think okay bless her she's about five foot I don't know something I'm quite a tall guy and she's quite diminutive and she's quite sharp don't get me wrong and she's to the point she uh, you know there's nothing wrong with her <laughs> but the point I'm trying to get at is that um, I for many years it's only just dawned on me in the last since the weekend it's, I've only just seen myself that in the past I wasn't even awake enough to see how awake she is. So she would be offering teachings to me and stuff like this, and I'd be thinking, mm, "Well, that's <laughs> you know that's all right, but I don't really agree with that or something, or uh, it doesn't seem to confer much advantage or use for my life, or I don't know, just judging it intellectually this way that way." Um, and she never kind of would be to overly push her views on me or something like that. She just would offer stuff and suggest stuff. And if I come to a retreat, okay. And if I don't, okay. You know, um, and she would encourage me is what she would do. Warmly encourage me. And um, But it, I just, you know, in terms of like the intellectual mind judging, um, this is really such a crucial thing that I've seen this weekend. Don't get me wrong, it's from two weeks or odd what I've been meditating every day now and that's why I pulled over here because I realised today I didn't do meditation because I have this fish tank in my in my van so I can't do bows but that, uh, that's an excuse here. I could find somewhere to do bows or whatever but um, so I've just done half an hour's meditation anyway and um, and yes this weekend you know I, I've realised that or it has become clear to me that uh, I judged and that in itself was a block from the teachings and it's not wrong to judge and it's not wrong to question everything actually All uh, that is crucial to question everything I think that's one problem of our society is we don't question enough but I don't want to get sidetracked by that and complaining and criticising but um, but yeah, no, I, I've seen now, like, it's crazy, the insight, like, the, you have the thing in my, in our Zen school, there's, um, they have Kong'an interview, right, so this is like where there's a lineage from Buddha right down to the present day where Buddha gave transmission to one of his pupils, one of his students, when he saw that this student had attained, attained some awakening, and that transmission has been passed down God knows how many generations, all the way to the present day, and so there are present day masters who continuing that lineage, and some of them are in our school, and in our school we have the tradition where, uh, say like once a week, if you're at a retreat, or if you live a monastic life or something, um, or even if you just drop into a Zen center to, you know, go meditate for an hour or something, you can get an interview with a Zen teacher or a Zen master, if there's sometimes a Zen master there. Um, and like Zen teachers are, have attained some awakening, I don't know, I can't tell you how much or whatever compared to a Zen master, but they've attained some awakening enough that they've been given transmission from a bona fide Zen master to say, okay look, you have enough awakening to be able to teach lay people or people that are new to, to meditation and stuff. And it's not an intellectual, you can't learn this and you can't teach it actually. Well, you. You can, but you can't teach awakening. You can't, it's a state of mind, and it's only through practice that you can actually attain it. And it's taken me so long to see that. Um, but, um, so yeah, this weekend at this retreat, you know, I have sort of been coming to and fro from the Zen path, path of no path, because there's, no, there's nowhere to go, there's nothing to get, there's nothing to attain, it's just right in this moment, always, you know, but <laughs> there's nothing special here, <laughs> and yet at the same time, um, this weekend I had the, I had this, 
Kongan interview with her, you know, and every previous time when I've gone back to Zen, and this is the trouble, I never persisted with it, you know, I would do it for a bit and then I'd kind of get bored or lazy or uh, distracted by other stuff in life. Maybe I, you know, think like Zen's all very well sitting on a mat and, and all this kind of thing, but I want to get a well paid job and, you know, um, you know, I want a nice relationship or I want to impress people or I want to go and, I don't know. But it's natural, all these desires that pull us around in life, and that's part of what Buddhism is saying, is, is um, you know, look, when you look <laughs> at the things that pull people in all kinds of different directions, not good, not bad, but just pretty crazy, really, sometimes, from one perspective. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, on all the previous occasions when I had um, a Kongan interview with a teacher or a Zen master, I never was able to penetrate a question and so here's the thing so they used the question to kind of test you and test where, whereabouts your awareness what level of awareness you're at and uh, there's no if you intellectually try to think about the answer to the question then you're you're not gonna answer you're not gonna be able to answer it correctly because the point is to stay completely like with a clear mind, clear like space, clear like a mirror, so that whatever comes, when the question comes to you, if you are at that state of awareness and you have a strong enough center and you have a clear enough mind, the answer will arise by itself. That's what they also, that's what the teachings say. It's like you can't learn it, you can't think about it. You can think about it, but you're not, even if you flukily got one question right or you gave an answer that was a right answer that teacher is going to test you from a different angle a different angle and check that you are fully genuinely at that state of awareness and if you're not and you're kind of you know trying to fudge it or something they they will they'll suss you out they will suss you out um, and I know because in the past I've kind of thought about answers to questions you know, Kong on, like Zen questions, and thought, ah, that would be a good answer. I'll give that answer and see you see what happens. And sometimes you get an okay reply, but then they'll test you from another angle and figure out that no, uh, you know, you're not really at that state of awakening. Um, so you can't try and be quick. If you try and be quick, like Alan Watts says, you know, if you try and be quick, that's going to obstruct you just as much as anything else. Um, and if you hesitate and think about it, that's going to obstruct you and you lose, you, you, you won't have it. So, for all these years, and I, it, I make it sound like oh, I've been trying incessantly for all these years, I haven't. I, I've dabbled, if anything, and I've kind of gone to it and meditated for a bit and done a couple of days retreat or whatever and then left it alone again and come away from it. And um, never really penetrated any any question not really you know I had some pretty cool answers like one documentary I, I was watching so like for, here's an example question right um, a Zen teacher the first question this is what happened to me like eight years ago now when I first went to my first retreat a Zen master who the bell rang it was my turn I went into the room I sat down bow, I bow to her she bows whatever and then she said to me, they have a stick, like a Zen master always has a stick with them, right, like uh, from back in the day. And it, back in the day, if they would hit you sometimes with the stick to kind of try and wake you up, because the whole thing is, look, it's all around us every second, but we're constantly obscured by thinking. And so the point is to try and snap you out of this constant thinking, churning, churning. So all Zen questions kind of are designed to put your brain out of gear so you're in a uh, state where you can't think of a logical answer because it's trying to derail that continual logical churning that we're stuck with from most of us from the moment we wake up to when we go to sleep more or less. You know, Western in the Western world thinking is like an endemic disease. It's not that it's wrong to do it, but we all do it all the time. We never stop. When do we ever have dedicated time that we give space to just be aware without thinking? You know, it might happen sometimes by accident. We might see a lovely view or 
I don't know, watch a dog running down a street or something and just in a moment, just hmm, some awareness, you know, but it's very fleeting and we don't value it particularly in the West. So the whole focus of Zen in particular as a, sex, as a branch of Buddhism is to try and snap people out of this constant thinking and so that's why every Zen question is like a designed to put your brain out of gear, right? So there's a famous, you, many people have heard this Zen question, what is the sound of one hand clapping? And think about it, what is the sound of one hand clapping? You know, when you think about that, it's like, okay, uh, well a clap by definition involves two hands, right? Um, so one hand clapping, it throws your brain out of gear. Now, some people go, oh, it's this, you know. But that's not really a clap. Is that a clap? A clap is, I think, involves two hands. Um, <laughs> but this is all thinking, right? So um, that's the focus of it. And what they say, like I heard Alan Watts years ago say that if while you're in, your brain is in that disengaged state where it's out of gear, it's not logically churning, and you're able to kind of look sideways, if that makes any sense, <laughs> um, in some way, then you can have instant sartori, like instant awakening. That's the whole thing with Zen is that you can't teach awakening, you can't learn it, and you can't really even work towards it. But you can practice, which is the only way to kind of work towards it. You can't, um, there's no roadmap really for this. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, this is all thinking. But just this is as much as, you know, I want this, I want this little blog series to be about my experiences of Zen and living in a van, so for right or wrong it's what it is but basically my Zen teacher she asked me a question so the bell rings right I'm sitting in the Dharma room and I'm, I'm meditating and we each take a turn everybody that's at the retreat takes their turn to go and be asked their question by the Zen master so the bell rings and it's my turn so I, I walk up to the room and I bow to the Zen master and sit down and I, I'm not going to give the game away because I don't want to spoil um, spoil it in a sense and it won't make any sense anyway <laughs> probably but uh, she asked me the question and and that's right when I'm on my way to the Dharma room you know all these all this kind of thinking like this is typically what would always happen to me is that I would be thinking okay you know now's your chance you know now's your chance to pass this test now's your chance to um, get beyond you know, make some progress here for crying out loud. And it's like, okay, notice all that thinking. Wow, lots of thinking and lots of desire to attain something, right? To attain some awakening or show I have some awakening or something like this, right? All ego and thinking and desire, right? And so at that moment, that makes it even harder to remain centered and to stay with don't know mind, which is what our school's teachers, like Dei Sung Sanim, who was our founding teacher who was like a profound Zen master he said you know keep a don't know mind it like um, in a way like when a baby is born you know Freud said when a baby is born it's not aware that it's looking through a pair of eyes because there's no self-awareness and so there isn't any concept of self and the rest of the world there aren't all these labels that we necessarily put on the world to make sense of it there's just like an experience there's there's no duality there's no and in that moment for that baby there is no life no death no self no other no right no wrong no opposites a state beyond opposites before opposites um a state beyond and before thinking um and in a way and freud i think said this as well is that and this is what a zen practitioner would argue is that that is the truest experience of reality is just naked this momentness, you know, without the labelling, without any churning, without any interpretation into symbols and ideas and words and thinking, just the present moment. Um, it's Pema Chodron said, and it's true, it's the simplest thing and the most profound thing at the same time. It's uh, unspeakable, you can't talk about, about this, you know. Um, like for example, to our ordinary thinking, we get so caught up in thinking and thinking that we know something, 
that when somebody like me is talking about something like this um, to someone in the West that is not familiar with any kind of any of this kind of thing would say well you know what actually we do know some stuff we know that um, we're living on a planet and we know that we're here for a certain period of time and that we die and we, you know we know loads of stuff we know loads about physics and geography and blah 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 blah, blah. and okay at one level that makes sense but wait wait a second physics is also now telling us that in fact without even taking it to that level at a simpler level if you speed this life up over a fast enough time frame I would say this is a van right this is my van but where did this van come from uh, all the parts of it the metal the rubber for the tires um, all the cables everything at some point came out of the earth and was manufactured or refined and manufactured into parts which were then assembled together and so it was created um, this van and if you fast forward far enough into the future this van won't be here forever it will eventually go to a scrapyard or it will some in some way or other it will eventually disintegrate back into the earth or be transformed into some new form right so that it's no longer a van it might be recycled or whatever but the point is the van or we think of a van as a thing it's not a thing it came from nothing right it came from being a part of the world or the earth or the universe let's say and into a temporary form and then that form is gonna at some point dissolve back into the universe and into other forms right so to say that there's one thing and that's the same that's true of people you know we came from the universe and we're going to disintegrate back into it sooner or later one day um, and that's the same of all forms nothing is permanent that's one of Buddhism's fundamental teachings is everything is impermanent um, and so and so actually what do we know we think we in the West we know all this stuff you know we know well okay well I'm I'm a person and it's like, well, hold on, that's to say you're a thing, if you sped it up over a fast enough time frame and you saw yourself come out of the, and coalesce, and then kind of, even every seven years, every cell in our body is replaced by new matter, every seven years. So every seven years, we're not even made of the same stuff. We are a phenomenon. And this was best put, I think, by, well, the best I've heard it, by Alan Watts, when he said, if you look in a river and you see a whirlpool, now, we call that a whirlpool, right, where the water's spinning around in a, in a circular motion. But he said at every second, at every split second, there's molecules of water, particles of water that are entering that whirlpool and exiting it. So actually the whirlpool isn't a separate thing in, in as much as it doesn't have clear boundaries at all. It's, it's, it's essentially a happening. It's um, a phenomenon you know, within a bigger phenomenon. It's a part of the river, but it's like this little curious phenomenon that we recognize and have to label as something independent. And like, don't get me wrong, like labeling is not, it's necessary. How could we go about our day and communicate with other people? And how could I be making this video if I wasn't, if we weren't all familiar with the same labels for stuff, right? It's essential. But like Alan Watts also said is that at some point, you know, we're, when we're a baby, we have none of those labels, we have none of those ideas, and we're just in this unspeakable state of reality with no duality in it, with no uh, life, no death, no opposites. Uh, and we have to, as we grow up, we develop ego and we accumulate all this knowledge and ideas and education, and that's not bad. But what Alan Watts says was that at some point, you know, if you really want to attain complete awakening because that kind of traps us in a dream we inevitably then always interpreting interpreting thinking thinking the thinking's not bad but it obscures reality from us is what he's is what they say the teachers and so at some point we need to um get rid of that like he, alan watts uses the d description of um salted meat he said like if you want to preserve meat you would need to salt it but before you eat the meat you would want to wash that salt back out and, he, and it's a dodgy analogy maybe but the point is we need to unlearn like Sung Sanim our teacher he said look people human beings are too clever we're always thinking 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 we need to become completely stupid 
and um, completely stupid. <laughs> and it sounds counterintuitive, like why would you want to do that? But the point that he's making is if we can stop this constant churning, 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 then we give space. And this is why practice, practice is the only way. Because meditation practice, when I say practice, I mean meditation practice, right? Or mindfulness. It, you can do it ev all day, every day, in any waking moment. And even actually, apparently you can do it in sleep. I'm not sure about this yet, but apparently you can. Um, is the only way. Because, you know, Zen, this path, unlike any and all intellectual academic study ever, Zen is fundamentally different. And also from any other kind of... Uh, religion, at least doctrinal religion, is different because it's not trying to teach you anything and it's not trying to get you to believe anything either. It's, it's actually the opposite. It's stripping away. It's trying to strip away the accumulated uh, knowledge and information that we have